Guillermo del Toro is back in our studio to talk about Pinocchio. How are you? Very good, man. Congratulations on this. No, thank you. It's great. You. Why Pinocchio? Did, 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 what did Pinocchio mean to you growing up? It was either the second or the third film I saw with my mother, and it was the first time in that long cinephile life of seven-year-old <laughs> Guillermo where I felt uh, somebody understood how dark it felt to be a child. And I was like, yeah, this is not a happy cartoon on TV. This is this, Somebody gets it. And, and I still have this feeling with Disney. You know, I think Disney had a huge reservoir of darkness to command the light also, you know? And I think narratively his films are full of uh, this ingenuity and this pain. Uh, so I, I felt it all. It was the first Disney movie I saw, and it hit me really the hardest. There is something about that. Like, I remember being a kid and my dad taking me to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Oh, yeah. And leaving because I was too scared. Yes. The yes. idea of that happening to a kid's cartoon. I, I, I We were with uh, Quentin Tarantino about four weeks ago, and he said, in all seriousness, he said, uh, the scariest, goriest movie, most violent movie I ever saw was Bambi. Yeah. He said, I had to leave the theater. I was so scared. So terrified, and and it's the first time you say, you mean my mom can die? Yeah. And my dad is going to be this shadowy figure saying, come with me, son. I, it's, like, it's like mythical. Yeah. And and I think uh, that proportion of Disney, people, when people say Disney-fied, uh, I go, yeah, pray tell me more, because this or that uh, don't correspond to the idea I have of Disney. So it's it's such a dark um, experience you have watching this film uh, when you're a kid, but then, so then what? Like you, you, you... Then I identify with Pinocchio very much. As you I, did? Yeah, I did, as I did with Frankenstein's creature, because I feel that they are both about a father just giving birth to a son, sort of in a haphazard manner, and sending the kid into what is an experiential, almost initiatic journey through life to figure it out without any real assistance. And I felt like that as a kid. I felt like uh, the, the truths and lies that the adults were praying uh, that I understood were all really hollow. And life was telling me a bunch of things that were different. So I love that aspect of it. And they are related in a way. You know, they are both creatures that don't quite belong in the natural world. And I felt like that as a kid. And uh, I had a really sense of, Otherness, like I didn't conform to the idea that people had of a young boy, healthy, playing football. I was like this rail thin, can you imagine that? Rail thin, pale, quiet kid that buttoned all his buttons in the shirt, that never spoke, looked around, really spooked, you know? So I identified with that. I didn't like at all. It, it stuck in my crow, the idea of obedience and being something you're not in order to be accepted. So those two things are completely counter in, in our Pinocchio. There's another, there's another connection between Frankenstein and your Pinocchio that I want to get to in just a second that, that I think we found. But first, I think it's helpful to set up for people who haven't seen it, that it's, yeah. it's set up. This is all, this whole, your Pinocchio yeah. happens during uh, between World War One and World War Two, so the rise of fascism yes. and, and Mussolini, which all happens, by the way, on the periphery or off screen. Yeah, and this is very important because I did the same in Devil's Backbone. I refuse, if I can avoid it, I refuse to have a, a proper war scene because then that upends the entire balance. Yeah, I need to keep it sort of off screen, but the dynamics of of the the sort of ghostly, corrosive parental power that fascism exerts over certain souls, it needs to be there. And it's in the story of the uh, fascist officer Podesta, Podesta and his son. But what, why? Example. Why did you want to bring Mussolini and fascism into this story at all? Because it's another paternal story. I mean, it's really the whole movie, including Jesus and God, is about fathers and sons. Oh, and yeah. Pinocchio is sort of a surrogate, imperfect messiah, uh, resurrecting and dying for those that he loves. I think that all these wires are crossed in my head and, and they all make sense in the in the way they inform each other. If I'm going to make a, a, a movie about disobedience being a virtue, 
what better place to set it than in an, an invisible uh, sort of string world where everybody obeys except the puppet? There are many, many, many reasons. And uh, if you think about a note being hit at a piano, these elements, death, life, how brief it is, fascism, the imperfect fathers and imperfect sons, they all hit the pedal on the note to make it a little more resonant with what I think it should sound like. But I heard that you always knew that you wanted Mussolini to be, like, the mm-hmm. fascism and Mussolini to be part of Pinocchio. Like, you've known yeah. that whenever you... Yeah. Like, that when you Prince were a kid, my, you were like, someday so, I'm going to make a Pinocchio. Since my 20s. Yeah. Since my 20s. And as a kid, I knew I wanted disobedience. I knew I wanted disobedience, and I, I knew I wanted him to, to sort of be unruly. Uh, but I didn't, you know, until my 20s when I was thinking, well, it would be great to do that. And then part of that, funny enough, ended up in Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah. Or Devil's Backbone. Yeah. And now it's, it's, it's like it, this movie belongs with those two in a very organic way. The, the, let's go back to something you were saying just then that the, and this is, it, it, I don't know if I fully remember my experience watching Pinocchio mm-hmm. when I was a kid, mm-hmm. but I, I have some recollection of it. And what I don't think happened in that, which I think happens in yours, is what you said earlier, that Pinocchio comes out and you're sort of expecting this sweet, lovable puppet, but he's uh, he's disobeying right from the very, very beginning. Yes, you yeah. know, he his father tells him, Geppetto tells him not to go to church. And he says, I'm going to church no matter what. You know, like his father tells him to stay here. Mm-hmm. He's going to, you know, he's disobeying. The idea that the puppet is the person who is... Has a will. Yeah. Yes. Well, t- talk to me about that. Well, the idea, uh, we wanted Geppetto to be really, really full of edges. He's a drunk. He's, a, he's not that super smart. No. He's a father that is very concerned with the way everybody looks at him. Yeah. And how Pinocchio makes him look. Uh, he's, he lost uh, a child. Yeah, he's lost a child, but he has fantasized. Uh, that memory, he has sort of made him a perfect son. Yeah. Uh, he is full of things that are baggage uh, for him to, to, to be a good father or a real father. And I thought this was the more interesting version. Instead of Pinocchio learning to be a real boy, which is nonsense. Yeah. Every boy is a real boy. Every kid is a real kid. Parents have a hard time becoming a real parent. And that was the story I wanted to pursue. And at the same time, that has to be tied with a really imperfect Pinocchio. When he's born, uh, we wanted to make the, the scene almost feel like Frankenstein's uh, lab, really full of uh, thunder and lighting and hammers and nails and uh, branches being broken, really traumat- traumatology of the birth, you know? And then... Uh, arrived to the birth of uh, Pinocchio uh, in the hangover. And Geppetto is completely unprepared, and this puppet doesn't control his body, and he looks like a spider. Yeah. He looks really weird, and he is a bit much. Yeah. He's breaking everything. He's asking all the questions. He will not obey. He will. He crushes the cricket. He bursts into church. It's really, they are really far apart from coming together. That's the ideal, dramatically, that's the ideal way to start a movie. Yeah. You know, but it also informs the theme. It's, 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 a, it's a story about imperfect fathers and imperfect sons. Isn't it also a story about, like, mortality? Like, I was watching yeah. this and I was yeah. thinking about, because, so in this in this story, I don't think this is giving anything away. In the story, Pinocchio dies a number yeah, of several times. Several times, yeah. Yeah, and he, go, he, and he comes back to life. And there's a couple of scenes where, I mean, there's one where they say something like, you know, you are going to, you are never going to die. Mm -hmm. You will die many, many times. Yeah. But they would not be real death. And and you said, and and, and she says um, that it's the brevity of life that makes it special. The idea that life is short. I didn't expect to have an existential crisis yeah. watching Pinocchio, yeah, yeah. but I kind of did. And I, I was curious, yeah. for, just for you, like, were you, when you, back to what you were talking about, you had a preoccupation when you were a kid with mm-hmm. uh, authority and with conformity. Yeah. Did you have a preoccupation w- with death or with I, I think this movie solves a lot of issues for me. I was very worried about death, but uh, there's a reason the maternal figure in this film is death. And as the the real maternal figure with Pinocchio, life is sort of uh, happy-go-lucky, giving life away, 
but without a plan. Death is very deliberately motherly and takes Pinocchio step by step into understanding what it is to be a real boy, what it is to be human, and she makes him, guides him all the way to him making the decision. I will go back and save my papa. You know, it's really moving for me because death, uh, as I aged and I lost my father and then I lost my mother, it, and, and I, I, I really feel that it, it makes you really humble in the sense that, oh, oh, it's coming, and it actually is beautiful that uh, I'm going to end. It's beautiful because if, if, if something doesn't end, it never be gone, period. And, and I was uh, saying is the metronome of life and death in the universe that marks our existence, and it never stops for anyone. That's beautiful. You are not that special, and therefore, while you're here, it's a very special time because this is all you're going to get. One ride, one time, that's it. So I find it very Mexican. It may be a little alien, but Mexico, we are full throttle because we know we're, where we're heading, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's still scary to me. No. You know what I mean? Because I remember, what was it? they're both scary because I grew up Catholic. I know you did too. Mm -hmm. And I remember being promised eternal life. And then I remember one day going like, Eternal life also sounds terrifying. Yes. Oh, no, no. Listen, look at my first movie, Kronos. A Geppetto-like figure with a, a granddaughter uh, is facing eternity and chooses to destroy the machine that gives him eternity to die. And the final scene is very much like the final scene of Pinocchio, is this figure dying in bed with a ray of light, exactly like Pinocchio, and the, the granddaughter by his side, finally at peace because the desirable thing in a vampire story is to end yeah you know i i really been i've been thinking about death since i was seven years old and i have never stopped and i and I, I think i finally understood one thing it's actually really really beautiful that we end and it makes uh, makes it great, makes it this life beautiful. But didn't you see a ghost? Yeah, and I, I'm not, and I'm not being silly. Yeah, yeah here. but I, I think. Look, I don't think I don't know what is past. What's that story that you did? You saw a ghost when you were twelve. I heard. You heard. A ghost. Ghost. I don't know what's. The, uh, I've heard two times. I've heard ghosts. Uh, what, whether they are illusions or not, when I was very young, about twelve years old, uh, I heard uh, the ghost of what I believe was my uncle breathing around me and moving around me. And, and it could have been a, a delusion, 100%. I'm not saying it was, but I heard it. And, and I heard it again uh, because I always ask for the haunted room in hotels. Really? And I'm always disappointed. You know, I you go to a hotel and you go, give me the haunted and, room? I, well, I know what hotels are haunted in theory, and I've gone through most of them. And I never got anything except one time in New Zealand in the Waitomo Hotel off-season, no guests, and we arrived, we were scouting for the Hobbit, and we, uh, everybody got a room in a different wing, and I said, can you give me the haunted room? It was in a different wing, and they said, sure, here it is, just drop the, and the, the person guarding the hotel left, is, just put the keys on the box when you leave. And around midnight, I started hearing screams in the room, and I started hearing a man's voice sobbing, in the room, and I put my earphones and I started to watch The Wire on my laptop because I was so scared. And I stayed, I watched the whole third season of The Wire. <laughs> <laughs> just to try it. I was just looking at the screen. Right. But I, what it is, I don't know. I, I don't have an explanation. Who has? Yeah. About what happens after? Does anything happen after? Yeah. You know, in the meantime, who cares? Let's just stay here and have a chat, have a coffee. Yeah, I know. Be good to each other. And oh, yeah. We'll That's be all okay. you can do. Yeah. Okay. Why were you thinking about death since you were seven? Because I was very scared. I, 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 when I was a kid, my father won the lottery when I was about six years old. He won a massive amount of money. He won $6 million in 1969. That is how, I mean, that's a lot of money That's now. a lot of money. To, to give you an example, on Sundays you had the million dollar movie on TV. Yeah. And he won six. Holy moly. He could have paid for the Planet of the Apes movie completely out of that <laughs> win. That's how big it wow. was. So our life was abandoned. He became this uh, 
noble, an noble gentleman. He had got. He wasn't before. No, no, no. He was middle. He had a mm. car dealership, yeah. and he was doing okay. Yeah. But but he's he, elevated to a all new. of a sudden, yeah. bam! Right, and and he bought encyclopedias to have an office with books, and he bought them. I read them. I read the entire encyclopedia of art, the entire encyclopedia, uh, Grolier, it was called, and one about health. It was an encyclopedia of health. And I learned every disease known to man at age seven. So every morning I would wake up and say, I have trichinosis, and I have multiple sclerosis. I have uh, leprosy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, and Catholic religion in Mexico is full of a really compulsive dread and desire for death. It's a really, I mean, only Filipino uh, Catholic religion is that obsessed with corruption of the flesh. Yeah. When you see a, 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 a saint in Mexico a, a made of plaster, is forensically right. So I, every every Sunday, and then I became the uh, official spokesperson of the Virgin Mary. I was like a little more than an altar boy. And we would go and rehearse speeches about the Virgin Mary in the catacombs of a Gothic cathedral in Mexico, which is completely insane. Somebody decided to make a Gothic cathedral called El Expiatorio uh, in the middle of my hometown. And in the catacombs, there were the niches. And when the priest would leave, we would look into the niches and see the only thing I remember seeing was the feet of a corpse and the sole of one of the shoes had been corroded, so you could see all the tendons and the bones of the foot, and we ran away. But everything, salvation, death, childhood, Catholicism just became a bundle, a knot in my soul. So how, does that lead to the storytelling? Like you chose... Yeah. To, yeah? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the great advantage of Catholic religion is great stories. Great stories, and told with a lot of verb and gore yeah. and lurid details. Yeah, you know, there's violence, there's uh, uh, explosions of uh, cities. There's God is like a super villain in a Marvel movie. <laughs> yeah, if you go to the Old Testament, yeah, God but is he's like, vengeful in the Old Testament. Oh, yeah, he's like yeah. Thanos. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you, you get you get Avengers six. You know, <laughs> oh, you know, the poor poor Job says. Excuse me, sir, uh, why? Shut up! <laughs> you know nothing. Yeah, yeah. You don't have the proportions to talk to me. Yeah. Or I made okay. one mistake, a small oh, yes, mistake. Yes. Well, forever. Thy shall be smiled. Yeah, forever. <laughs> For forever, all of eternity because yes, yes. you messed up one thing. And then yeah, my yeah. grandmother used to tell me stories that were absolutely dire of St. Teresa or any childhood saint, saint uh, any childhood saint uh, in her obsession, she would say, and then this, li this little boy saw how the, the missionaries were tortured and boiled, and I was like, thank you, Grandma. <laughs> anyway, all that is in Pinocchio. <laughs> <laughs> and every movie I've ever made, I mean, I tell you, the line between Kronos and Pinocchio is yeah. a straight line. But I think where I, what, what, I, what I was trying to figure out there was the why of the storytelling at all. So that's what it is. Like you're, oh, yeah. you you learn through Catholicism and through your... your Net movies, obviously. Yeah. My mom was a big cinephile, or rather she liked going to movies, really. And, and there are three things that more than come in. One is uh, nannies telling you stories, uncensored. So there was a lot of ghosts and the devil, and there is a stone in my hometown that is covering a cave where the devil plays cards at night. And I was like, whoa, that's one. The second one is radio plays. I was born in 64. So when I was five or six, we would uh, get, uh, everybody would get in the kitchen after TV ended around eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night, TV ended, but radio continued. So we would listen to a radio play, uh, The Mad Monk, and it would tell stories of horror, and we would be listening and, and dreaming. And the, the final component is uh, Mexican syncretism. You know, uh, Mexico was partially conquered because uh, the friars decided to blend pagan mysticism with uh, Catholic myth. The friars who... The fr who, who came with the conquistadors. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they decided the only way we're going to get these uh, people to obey is if we make uh, our Catholic myth palatable with uh, fusing it with their mythology. Uh -huh. You know, so th <clears throat> that's why the Virgin of Guadalupe is dark-skinned and is uh, 
a mother that appears to to uh, Juan Diego. I mean, these are things that are constructed so, that so, way. So you see there that there's like tremendous power in yeah. just tales, in just storytelling. Death and life on Pinocchio look like Mexican carvings uh, from a hundred percent the 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 cherubs, not the cherubs, the seraphims, and the archangels in um, colonial paintings, they have uh, eyes on their wings. This is from Judeo-Christian mythology where they, they each of those eyes is going to close when a soul dies. And that's in, in Pinocchio. And Mesopotamian, uh, which precedes Judeo-Christian mythology, the wings are also carved in a certain way. So all these things, the amount of things that influence a narrative is infinite. So those uh, things from your childhood are in, in this film. And, in. and things from my adulthood. And, yeah. I mean, I think that there's a great fairy tale about uh, three brothers that set on the road to marry a princess. And whoever the brother impresses the princess the most, who's really bored, will win her hand. And in comes this strapping young lad, and he's going to tell her about his adventures. And the second lad is also very brave. And the third lad is a quiet, pale kid that is gathering trash on the road. Oh, a dead bird. I'm going to put it on my pocket. A little bit of cord. I'm going to put it in my pocket. A stone. And and when they come in, that the two strapping lads have very little to say. But this guy pulls out the dead bird, and the princess goes, "What is that? Yeah, a dead bird. Why, why do you have it in your pocket? Well, I thought it was really beautiful. Look at the feathers." And he has a story to tell, you know. And I think that's uh, the storyteller is the person that picks up useless little things along the road and has stories to tell about them. And that's you. That's 100% me, man. What do you get out of it? What do you like about it? What does it give you? I think it, it, what it gives everybody, if you can tell a story and you are, you are sort of organizing the universe in some way, that's why we did it. If, if, we were nomadic tribes, right? Going with each uh, of the seasons. Yeah. And when we learned to use fire and we settled on a cave, what's the first thing we decided to do? Tell stories. Yeah. So it, we organize the universe through stories. And through Pinocchio, we organize honesty. We organize uh, the only, obedience. The, the, the disobedience being a virtue. The only truth you cannot uh, uh, destroy is telling the truth about who you are. That's the essential thing in life. Things like that. Life, the brevity of it. To me, all the, all the, all the things I can say about cosmically being there are all in the last line of the movie, what happens, happens, and then we're gone. And there's a humility to it, a surrendering to it. And I think that's, that's the thing. I think the older you get, the more you surrender in a great way. Uh, before I let you go, uh, last time I saw you, I don't know if you remember this, I saw you, I was walking down this, it was one of the great thrills of my life was <laughs> just, what, what, I, I just moved, I hadn't lived here very long, right? And I'm from like a, a little island in the middle of the North Atlantic, right? <laughs> and I had talked to you before and that, then- See, that's a great story already. Yeah, I'm from- <laughs> From a, a little island in the North <laughs> Come on, uh, yeah. come on, dude. I am, I'm from a little beginning. island in the middle of the North <laughs> Atlantic. How great is that I beginning? I moved to the big city <laughs> the, the, and the, I talked- Made to, of stone. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> and, I, and I talked to you. Yeah. And on the show about the Monsters exhibit. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, I think maybe a year after that, you win Best Picture at the Oscars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there I am walking down. I'm going to do some of my storytelling now. Mm -hmm. There I am. Cause I tell the story a lot. <laughs> in the city. I'm walking down the street yes, in the city yes. with my headphones on, walking mm -hmm. towards, at the end of a long day, walking towards the streetcar. And at the building where the Toronto Film Festival happens, yes. uh, there, there is a, the light box, they call it. Yeah. There is a, like a, a secret, not a secret door, but there's a door that opens up out of a wall. Oh, yes. It doesn't look like a door. Yes. And all of a sudden, that door pops open, <laughs> terrifying me. And who is standing me there in front of me? A large figure comes out. <laughs> you. <laughs> Hard to figure it out. You yeah. are standing yeah, yeah, there yeah, and yeah. you look at me and I don't think either of us were expecting to see one another. Yes, yes. You had just one best picture. Yes, yes. I gave you a big hug and I just yeah, said like, man. hey man, congratulations. And you were like, thank you, thank you. And then that was kind of all we could do. And it was very meaningful to me. That, that yes. story was very meaningful to me. I'm glad, I'm glad about that. Because I think that's that's a, <laughs> that's life right there. Yeah, we just meet very briefly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> say thank you, thank you. Yeah. I moved on. <laughs> yeah, and I haven't seen you since. Yeah. Let, answer me this: What? Give me one thing that changes when you win Best Picture. 
Uh, well, there is, uh, however, the amount of chip on your shoulder you had, and it can be big, it can, you cannot quantify it, there's a thing that happens that is very physical, and it goes away. It goes away. It's almost like a an imposition of the hands in a ritual. It goes away. Like, cast, I cast you out, spirit. Really? And it happens like this. You... Your, your point of view is from the seats and you're looking at the stage like everybody at home and all of a sudden you get up and you walk up the steps to the stage and you turn around and you see the theater and everybody you have admired in your craft in some way or another is sitting there or standing, clapping and something goes away. There's like a wave of for someone like me, who has never quite belonged in one way of filmmaking or another, because I'm worried about uh, pop narratives and fantasy and fable, and I'm not quite uh, a guy that uh, fits in the commercial. I'm, I'm not ha handing out blockbusters every week. Someone, they're telling you, one of us, in a, in almost like a Todd Browning freaks kind of way, and you feel a belonging for the first time in your life. Whether it's real or not, it doesn't matter. It just heals a little bit of that hairline fracture in your heart, and it doesn't come back. It stays healed. It never and, came back. And you can move on to other things. Oh, my God, Guillermo. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what I was expecting with that answer, but that's beautiful. But it's real. That's the thing. And you move on to other things, which is the nature of humanity. We go, okay, what do I worry now? <laughs> yeah, and, and for Pinocchio, life continues to happen. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it's fine. Congratulations on the film, man. Thank you, man. It's really beautiful. This was a blast. Lovely to talk to you, as always. <laughs>